I am Father Rob McChesney, a Jesuit priest, and I am here for the next hour in this uh, workshop on Ignatian Imaginative Contemplation as Liberation, Prayer as Resistance. There'll be four sections to the workshop. Um, you'll see how it unfolds. But he, I'm here, first of all, to tell you I have seen Jesus face to face. I've heard the timbre of his voice. I've touched wounds. Imagination. The formal use of the imagination in contemplative practice in the Western tradition is ancient. It dates at least to the 14th century. Uh, there was a bestseller in the 14th century by Ludolf of Saxony called uh, Vita Christi, The Life of Christ. And that book had a huge impact on Ignatius of Loyola in the 16th century. And it was Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, who popularized uh, Ignatian contemplation. Many of you have made Jesuit retreats and are familiar with this. Imagination, imagination. This workshop includes four components. I'm gonna do a brief introduction to the critical importance of the faculty of imagination. Second, I'm gonna present an authentic first person account a case study exemplifying the liberative power for justice of imaginative contemplation. Third, we're going to have uh, prayerful participation in short scripture-based Ignatian contemplation. I've got some cushions around the perimeter of the room if people feel more comfortable there, or you can stay in your chair, you can uh, you can walk around, as Bo was saying. You can feel free to pray in whatever way works best for you. And finally, I hope we'll have time for uh, some questions and answers for you to share the experience of your contem contemplative prayer, uh, ask crush questions, debrief. Uh, and we do have, I think Bo told me, we have 30 to 40 people online with us, which is very exciting. Okay, part one. This, these notes are from, uh, it was a bestseller by uh, a psychiatrist named Bessel van der Kolk. Uh, some of you may have seen it or read it. Read it. The Body Keeps the Score. Um, and in this volume, written for survivors of trauma and, and for trauma psychologists, uh, Dr. Van der Kolk says, imagination is critical to the quality of our lives. The faculty enables us to leave our routine existence behind, to leave our, the uh, available five senses. We could leave that behind to form a mental image of new ideas, new images, new concepts, new possibilities, new worlds. Think of um, science fiction. I just saw the film version of Dune because I needed, my imagination needed to go to another world. This world can get a little overwhelming at times. We need this capacity. Imagination is a launch pad for making our hopes and our dreams come true. It can fire our creativity. It can alleviate our pain. It can enrich human intimacy. Stop for a moment. Imagine life without imagination. It's kind of a brain twister. Neurobiologists tell us that after someone experiences a traumatic event, their nervous system is altered. So there's a lot of neurobiological, physiological uh, ramifications to trauma, uh, which is a particular interest of mine, because it's robbing people of their lives and of their imaginations. When traumatized people are trapped by past painful memories, Invariably, they suffer from a failure of imagination, a loss of mental flexibility. They get focused on the past, past memories, past hurtful memories after violence. 
um, such that there's little capacity to hope, to envision change. We're t we want uh, liberative justice. Um, the numbers on traumatized people are astronomical. Um, and they're too often invisible in our society. Um, so I want to help them to rediscover their imaginations, as well as many ordinary people like us who, for whatever reason, don't have a great capacity to imagine a new future. To be inspired by the book of Revelation, to be inspired by a work of art, so, part two, I want to simply uh, read a first-person account by a survivor of trauma um, and watch how her imaginative contemplation healed Maggie personally and liberated her for justice and service for a life of liberative justice. So this is Maggie's story. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a pseudonym, obviously, but this is her account. There's a story I tell all the time about the retreat that changed my life. How I was a shy 19-year-old sophomore in college who went on retreat just because it was at the beach and there was a cute guy working at the sign-up table. But I came home with people I could eat lunch with how it got me involved in campus ministry this retreat, where I discovered that faith was about so much more than always knowing the right answers. I found joy in community, started leading retreats and doing street outreach to people who were homeless. I got fired up about social justice. I switched my major to theology. I say it and I say it again, that retreat changed my life. All of this is true, but it's not the whole truth. I almost never tell the whole truth, not about this, but for you, I will now. The retreat that really changed my life happened two years later over winter break of my senior year. It was a silent retreat, five days of prayer and Ignatian contemplation, punctuated by daily meetings with a spiritual director. I already had a good relationship with Father Anonymous, my assigned director. Even so, it took me until the last night of retreat to tell him why I had been a well-controlled mess the whole time he'd known me. In the summer between my sophomore and junior years, I worked at the New Jersey shore for the summer. It was a childhood dream come true. It had not been part of the dream, however, to be raped by a guy I just met in the middle of a Friday afternoon in my own bed just a few hours before my boyfriend was due to arrive for the weekend. I carried that trauma through the second half of my college years, battling anorexia, damaging my relationships, struggling at every turn to be an academic and co-curricular success while my insides felt like broken glass. I told Father Anonymous the story on that last night of retreat, and he gave me an assignment. Revisit the day, he said, but take God with you. Remember, if you believe that God is always with you, it means he was there too. So go back and walk through the day again, but this time try to see yourself through God's eyes. And that's the retreat that really changed my life. Years later, a therapist raged against Father Anonymous's guidance. It was totally irresponsible, she said, to send me off alone like that to revisit a traumatic memory. But I wasn't alone, I said. She scoffed. I found a new therapist. 
As often as I have told the story of that first retreat, it never even occurred to me that I could dare tell about this second one until now. But the truth is, despite how wonderful it was to discover community and homeless outreach and social justice, all the most important things I believe about God were forged in that one night of prayer and unpacked in the decades that followed. Following my director's instructions, I settled into the big, comfortable chair in my retreat center room. In my imagination, I walked to the chapel and knelt in front of the cross, praying for the courage to do this. I asked Jesus for help, and he reached out and took my hand, then walked with me to the doorway of a room I had been afraid to enter. I opened the door, and together we walked through the events of that day from the first moments I could remember. I tried to pay attention, as my guide had suggested, to what Jesus was feeling and how he was regarding me. I experienced his joy in the morning as I baked cookies on my day off and then headed to the beach with a book to top off my tan. I felt Jesus' apprehension as I quite uncharacteristically allowed a stranger to strike up a flirtatious conversation. I felt Jesus' anxiety rise as I ignored what I now know were red flags. I felt his helplessness as I agreed to let the guy walk me back to my little apartment. And I felt Jesus rage and weep as I had not been able to at what ensued. We went through the day more than once. We went through it until my feelings gentled and a sense of calm washed over me. Now I was ready to go out the door on the other side. Never having let go of my hand, Jesus escorted me at last into a beautiful garden. Although it would take many years and more than one good therapist to put Humpty Dumpty back together again, I can hardly describe just how important to me was the healing that came from my imaginative prayer experience on that second retreat. Although I usually stay away from gendered pronouns for God, at the time, all I knew was that the God who revealed himself to me that night was the God I wanted to follow. The God who walked with me that night beheld me from the heavens, but not from afar. God beheld me intimately. He knew me and he cherished me. He did not judge me for the naive choices and reckless decisions without which the guy could not have wound up in my room. He did not condemn, criticize, or lecture me. Jesus wanted my good, my healing, even more than I wanted it for myself. He was so far from the God of right answers that it was a wonder they answered to the same name. This is the God who has kept me working in ministry for 30 years, in a street center, in a hospital, and on two college campuses. Because this God who took my hand and showed a desire to be intimately involved in my life was just as interested, it turned out, in every other person's life as well. And so, I try to be, too. Let's just sit with Maggie's story for a moment. I, I keep in touch with Maggie, and she does splendidly well.
she gets that contemplative prayer is about healing, obviously, but healing to be at the service of others who are broken. And so her ministry has been to uh, work for liberative justice, if you will. For the, uh, the invisible, the marginalized of our world. So I give thanks for Maggie and everybody like her. And now I'm, I want to suggest that we take a few moments to do a, our own contemplative prayer exercise. Um, uh, Bo, Professor Bo, who organized the conference, uh, has over some months convinced me that um, even over Zoom, God is present on Zoom and in the midst of technology. And um, she's right. I have learned she's right. So today, what I'm going to do next, part three, if you will, we're going to have our own um, experience of contemplative prayer. I say experience, you know, you can't program the Lord's spirit to be present. So maybe I should tamp down expectations. Um, <laughs> I, I did this in Bo's class last fall and um, people had a remarkable experience, including Bo herself. We're going to do the Good Samaritan passage, which one I had done in Bo's class, and you heard her say maybe she, for the first time, experienced her, all of the Asian American violence. For the first time she experienced herself in this contemplation is, is the mugged traveler in the ditch requiring the assistance of a Samaritan. Um, so it's an experiment. We can't presume upon God's presence. Um, we can anticipate that um, God wants to, 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 to do amazing things all of the time. That's our hope and an anticipation, but we know it doesn't, the mag it's not magic. So tamp down expectations. Um, if you have a, a, an experience of God or profound prayer, prayer, Praise God. If you don't, you'll, 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 you'll have a sense of the mechanics, because I'm going to walk you through kind of the mechanics. And it's the kind of thing you can experiment with your own. You know, do try this at home, because it, it's around, as I say, from the 14th century. And it's, it's wildly popular today, Ignatius's. Um, so, as always, you know, we, we see what happens. I'm going to use the Good Samaritan pa uh, parable, just a brief intro. Um, you know, it's one of the best known, the best loved gospel narratives out there. Uh, most of us have probably formed a rather static mental picture of the details and of the narrative. We tend to get frozen by literal hearing of text, literal meaning of text. At some level, you know, even we reformed and ecumenical and Roman Christians and Catholics, we can get a little fundamentalist sometimes how we approach sacred text. So free your imagination, um, whatever happens here, it's not going to be like you've uh, necessarily read it in Luke's gospel. Um, uh, some of you are students. At the, so you, you may have written uh, exegesis papers that you're very proud of uh, about the Good Samaritan. Well, forget that exegesis paper. Um, some of you are preachers, I know. Um, and, uh, and you've no doubt preached on the Good Samaritan, and you're very proud of your, your, your sermon. Well, forget that sermon you're so proud of, because 
We don't want to get locked in. The scripture is, it's, it's, it's poetry before it's prose, it's art, it's music, it's, it's dynamic. Um, but we forget that easily enough. It's, I don't know, maybe it's jazz, David. Uh, you know, it's kind of, it's like this type of prayer is, can be very extempore which is one reason I've come to like it. It might make you a little nervous. Some people like an answer. Say, well, it, it, no, if you, if you think you know what the text means, um, you don't. Because it needs to be fresh. It, it can mean something new and special. Why well, pray it, it often means something different because because I'm different one day from the next, and my needs are different one day than the next, okay? Um, what else might I say? See the parable of the Good Samaritan as a platform for fresh, individualized, authentic, scripture-based, Mystical experience, mystical experience. You know, it's, it's not that woo kind of spooky stuff for Ignatius, and many of you are familiar with Ignatius prayer. It's very grounded sort of a stuff, a kind of a prayer. Um, and mysticism often is. So it's the kind of prayer Maggie experienced and described. It's been available in the Christian tradition for hundreds of years, and it always, is a gift of God. So, um, Sam, maybe you can subdue the lighting, and I'm going to lead you through uh, an imaginative contemplation. Um, you can stay seated in your chairs. We've put some cushions around the perimeter of this room. Uh, you want to get yourself comfortable uh, in a way that you can be relaxed. Whatever works best for you, and that goes for you at home. Uh, place yourself in a position, maybe a favored prayer, prayer position. Maybe you're overlooking your garden, a beautiful nature scene, wonderful. And we'll take, you know, 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes or so. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Any questions before we begin, kind of what we're up to here, this man Jesuit? Okay. Yeah, me too. You know, sometimes maybe that's what you need yes. before God. It's the afternoon after lunch. I yes. said, Professor Bo, can't you give me a morning slot for a prayer? I'm going to turn the lights off. You know, so maybe you need a nap. If so, then that's God's will. Amen. Amen. Maybe I'll fall asleep. I don't know. That's any other comments, questions? Have a good time. Have a good. You're listening. I'm going to I'm going to be directive. I'm going to tell you some things I want you to do. Now I invite you to do this. Now I invite you to do that. Um, so, yeah, listen to me and I'm going to be working from the scriptural text. But in a fresh way, mm -hmm. but yeah, so, so you, you're familiar with the, the text. That's good. You've done all of your exegesis. You've preached on it. Good. So you have a strong foundation. Good. Now we want the spirit to work within all of that past work. Okay? So you all have a comfortable posture. So I invite you to close your eyes. Make sure you're in a silent environment and kind of a silent place in your heart. Power your energies down. Power within towards your soul's center. Silence is the great revelation, said Lao Tsa. I invite you to maintain this prayer mode for about 15 minutes or so. 
Many people have told me what a difference it makes to their practice when they pray this kind of prayer together with a group rather than alone in your rooms. There's a corporate communal spirit hovering over us. Like Maggie, you're now embarking on an unpredictable imaginative adventure in which you may just encounter the holy. Trust God at work in this flow. Take off your sandals for you're in the you're on holy ground with Moses. Reverence the space you're in, the ground upon which you sit, the desk upon which you sit. We believe God is present in all of this. So reverence everything about your space. Now, please open the eyes of your imagination. Open the eyes of your imagination. I invite you to notice the terrain around you on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Is it dusty this day? Stony? Flat? Hilly? What about the weather conditions? Where in the sky is the sun? Feel the grain of sand in your eye. Look, here comes a lone traveler on the road. Notice his dress and demeanor. Is he carrying anything? Anything distinctive about this traveler that you notice? Oh my goodness, look at what's happening. Where did those guys come from? Look what they're doing to him. No, no. Imagine the setting and the events as vividly as possible. Pay attention to your feelings. Use your visual imagination your auditory imagination, your tactile imagination. Maybe the events remind you of something in your own experience. Now, visualize the priest and the Levite approaching on the road. Notice their dress and demeanor. Watch them as they, as they near the mugged traveler. Listen, they are speaking to one another. What are they saying?
And now they're moving away. Imagine the setting and the events as vividly as possible. Pay attention to your feelings. Do the events remind you of anything in your own experience? Now, notice the reaction of the victim survivor as the priest and Levite pass him by. What does he see? What does she see? What is the victim survivor feeling? And hearing. Does she speak to the priest and Levite? Does he gesture? Pay attention to your feelings. Now, notice the Samaritan as he approaches, or she. What does the Samaritan look like? What does the Samaritan see? Look, he's stopping and reaching out to help. Take a few moments to allow all the gestures, words, looks exchanged in this extraordinary encounter to impact you as if you were present. Use your visual imagination, your auditory imagination, your tactile imagination. Pay attention to your feelings. Where are you in these events? Can you see yourself? In the ditch with the victim survivor? Do you see yourself in the Samaritan, the priests, the Levites? Where is God?
Finally, I invite you to draw yourself away from the events on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Keep your eyes closed. I invite you to close in brief conversation. A few minutes of conversation with Jesus as you would with a friend as Saint Ignatius puts us in puts it in the spiritual exercises. Be in conversation with Jesus as you would be with a friend who has your back or with your higher power if you prefer that terminology. As we begin to wind down our contemplation, is there anything you wish to say to Jesus? Or him to you? Express to Jesus in this privileged moment, mystical moment perhaps, express to him any strong desires or spiritual inclinations that the Holy Spirit inspires within you. You're looking now at Jesus as he looks back lovingly at you. The definition Bo uses of contemplation. As Jesus regards you, does he have anything he wants to say to you? Spend a minute with that, and when you're ready, you can open your eyes and gently return to the group. So I'm going to invite Sam maybe to ease the lights up a little bit, ease people back from their nap time or their mystical contemplation or some combination thereof. Feel free to use the restroom. So folks, we're, folks at home, we're reassembling. And I want to reverence the space you're in. It it's, can be a very tender space when you've been in, if you've been in some kind of uh, warm, intimate with, encounter with the Lord. That, that's privileged space that I reverence and celebrate. 
if you haven't been in such a space and it's been more of a just following the mechanics, that's okay too. You see how this is one of two or three models of an, of an imaginative contemplation. So you have that experience. Um, and you know, Sam, I think you can tell, uh, is it Tyler, Chase? The fellow, he can come out because we're going to do a little conversation. And so one of the IT guys, we're going to see if there's some questions from uh, from the people following on the long live stream. Thanks. Um, so this is kind of commentary, comments, questions. Um, to begin with, does anyone want to share any any aspect of your experience, whether it was a real mystical experience or not? Um, what was going on for you during that time? It's quick, that was quick. Um, I was just saying that I'm not quite finished going through the experience because um, I'm still witnessing a person who's in the ditch right now and brokenhearted and, and thinking about, um, I'm actually seeing a lot of bodies thrown in the ditch and overwhelmed with what to do because it's a collective experience of seeing so many places that are hurting over the past year, over the past months, and asking the Lord Jesus, what do I do? How can I be that person who is helping? I feel overwhelmed, and I think he wanted to just sit with me in that place for a minute of just grieving, because he is grieving too. And I don't know quite how to take it right now, because it's a lot. Do we have a, somebody have a hanky it. Kleenex? Yeah. And that's why I'm not finished. Because there's so much that can be done, and yet he hasn't, we haven't even gotten to the next thing of what can I do. It's more of just soaking in the reality of that because it's a lot. No, no, that's, thank you. Um, so you have more. You need, you feel like you need more time, yes. So I was rushing it. Okay, so I'm given one hour, you know. Again, we're trying to, sh you know, shape the spirit to our schedule, which you can't do. Uh, but cool, so you've, you have more work to do, more spiritual work to do, because what has happened for you is really important. You've had, that's a genuine, mystical experience. Uh, that's a genuine, imaginative, contemplative experience. Um, one thing that strikes out, st stands out, is the grief. Uh, so as contemplatives uh, in this broken world, we need to know how to grieve, because we're invited to do it. Parents, I know I met your son earlier. I mean, parent, I have six married uh, siblings. You know, what, what, what parents go through, grandparents. Breeze, there's so much grieving required in this world. Yeah, so, uh, wonderful that Jesus, you're doing that with Jesus. Be because Jesus grieves. I think you nailed it. You met Jesus grieving. I think he grieves over this world. Uh, we heard this yesterday from some, some speakers, so thank you so much. And when we grieve, 
we have a friend who can take us by the hand and help us to heal and move beyond it. Um, anybody else here in the room or if you're getting a question from home? Okay. I think I brought questions that um, Bo asked us earlier, like what do we hope to expect? And I had written down some of those questions and I encountered those again on the road. Just um, part of the discussion I wrote early on is this question of evil and how to navigate that. And I had written some of those questions down. And in the morning we talked about Satan and um, that piece of spiritual warfare and how do we know that we are not enacting that violence ourselves by our own wounding. And then the other discussion was on uh, comfort, how we want comfort so much that we want a quick answer. And so I came into the story and I wanted maybe a quick answer from Jesus on what I'm experiencing and there was ambiguity through the process and I I kept resonating with the <laughs> That's how okay. much I want comfort uh, as a piece yeah. of confirmation uh, even in the imaginative space that I want it to be so um, spelled out, I would say. And that ambiguity uh, is part of the tension to sit in with Jesus, that, um, that that message is okay to listen to. And I am the person on the road. I am the Levite. I am the person. I'm all of them walking. Uh, not wanting to participate, feeling like a victim, all those pieces, and that that can be a message to absorb and listen and not have to act immediately, but to listen in, in truth to that. And that step that I'm longing for, because I'm in a, in a space right now, and I want that answer, like, just do this. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Just quit your job. <laughs> uh -huh. Just go here, and and, and um, that ten that reminded me that I need that tension. Um, that that's okay to to wait with Jesus. Just throw yourself off the parapet of the temple. <laughs> just do this. Just do that, and you're you're. Your anxieties will be resolved. You're, you, you're, you're, you, you will find comfort. Yes, I'm going back to that workshop that you're alluding to uh, with Andrew about evil. And sometimes I think it's, and I use that scene of the devil tempting Jesus. Just throw this, you know, sometimes I think we can be tempted for truth with a capital T, and that was Leonard's workshop here earlier in the old days of the catholic church maybe of mainline protestant churches i don't know in the old days we looked more for truth with a capital t and answers now i mean there are plenty of fundamentalists doing that but boy it's often not that simple and there can be tremendous comfort in just acknowledging that just accepting the ambiguity, as you say, and that somehow God is present in that. And Jesus, and Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, Father, take this cup away from me. But, I mean, if that's not what you want, you will be done. But take this cup away from me. I mean, here's a man riddled with uncertainty. To the point to the point that it's an agony 
Thank you. This, again, this stuff is real, authentic mysticism, as Ignatius would define it. Um, yeah. Uh, we've got one on the chat. Um, and this person said that they also wanted to wait longer and to hear from Jesus. Um, dot, dot, dot. Clearly experienced his presence and love. Wasn't sure if he wanted to say something more. And then they just expressed uh, gratitude for this space and that moment. Oh, thank you. Where is that speaker from? Do we know? Um, doesn't say the location. Okay. Their name's Samantha. Samantha. Samantha, do you want to let us know where you're from? That's fine. Uh, thank you, Samantha. Oh, yeah, no. We hear anything. <laughs> uh, so another person would like a little more time. Spot on. It, it was rushed. Um, and now she has a tool. This is, this is a tool, it's a prayer tool, so it's a good way to put it maybe. It's not magic. Uh, it's not some kind of magical, mystery, magical, mystical tour. Remember that, the Beatles? No, it's a tool. It's like any other kind of tool. You, you have your road prayers and you have your rosary and you have the mass and you have your devotions. These are tools to help us to meet the Lord intimately and personally and profoundly. Uh, this particular tool is very useful, uh, can mediate mystical prayer. That has been its, uh, it's, it's been what it's done in the tradition, a very profound kind of a mystical prayer. Um, so it's one more tool to put in your your, your 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 arsenal or whatever the word is. Yes, ma'am. So I didn't experience a per se mystical experience. As I mentioned earlier, I'm fighting not falling asleep because um, I did not get a good night's sleep last night. But I have to say in the last two years with COVID, even though we were being forced to be alone, right, away from society. Um, many of us, myself included, um, do not have the discipline of being alone with the Lord uh -huh. in a space where you, you ask us for 15 minutes to shut everything off um, and to only listen to the audio and also to the, the beat of what is transpiring. Yes. And I... Um, and for me, not centering often, I had a lot of difficult time. I mean, I had a kaleidoscope of colors going through my mind that I'm trying to pull myself back into the story. Okay. And then not, 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 not seeing the text before me was difficult because I say, well, wait a second, we're, I'm only getting dust on my feet and you already moved on. Where, where, where is Jesus? So I got very disoriented. Okay. However, I know from past when I did an exercise where I'm sitting down for dinner and I imagine Jesus sitting in front of me. And then I, we were having a dialogue and I, I, and I become very mindful. It's been powerful. So uh, you are absolutely correct. This is, this is not just a tool. We need this right now. We need this time of the ability to just sit with the text and to let the characters become alive and let our senses dwell into that space and just experience and it may not be a mystical per se where whoa we're going to get a word we're going to get anything right. but it's a downtime that your soul gets a chance to be still amen amen um yeah i mean really good stuff if you're tired this is not, you don't want to go to this type of a prayer because this prayer requires alertness. And once you close your eyes and if you're tired, you know, good luck. So, you know, when you're choosing your, what style of prayer, what tool will you use? If you're feeling tired a little bit, psychically weary now, 
No, not this one. You used something more devotional. Um, and you had one other good thing to say. The silence. Yeah, silence. Yeah, the chair, Jesus across from you at the table. Well, sometimes when my brain is, my psyche is, is, is capable of contemplation, which is maybe one third of the time, you know, because life is too crazy. Uh, I'll just, I'll put a chair, you know, I'll be sitting here and I'll put a chair there for Jesus. It's right out of the Christian tradition. In the Old Testament, you put a chair there for Elijah. Hospitality, because maybe Elijah is going to show up and you want to symbolize hospitality. So, yeah, so use senses. Ignatius was a huge proponent of this five senses. You know that if you've done Ignatian prayer. Uh, he calls it the application of the senses. So if you're a sensual body person, um, th this can be for you. And if you're feeling tired, stand up and get your body into it. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I was going to say, um, I think that, I think with anything like this, um, I would definitely like more time as well. But also I appreciated the, um, the pacing of it because I think for me personally, um, I can tend to try to reshape things that I initially see because it, I want it to fit into what it probably should be, but then it, then I had to just stick with what I thought of first and then it was more um, impactful for me because at first when you said a lone traveler, we're from New York City, and so I imagined myself on, and then someone else walking down the road that I perhaps felt threatened by um, being by myself, um, but then that person got beat up and I was like, oh, wait, that's, that's that person, not. Um, so then I think my mind would have tried to fix it to be more like um, what I thought the story should be, but you said it, it should be different. And then, like m my mom said, also I felt, I felt it was mystical in the sense that then I felt at times I was the person as the victim, but then I also felt like I was the person leaving and being left. You know, there were many different forms that were passing through, and I think that the pacing you gave was very interesting because it, it kind of made you go through and, and commit to what you were, uh, what I was thinking at least. So I appreciated, I appreciated it. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. And you know, I wouldn't make it too big and, and we'll finish up here. I wouldn't make too big a deal out of this, but there are generational variables. So, I mean, it's, it, it, to some degree when I'm working with younger people, I'm more inclined to keep the pace a little quicker because you know, the attention span is shorter, you know. So, but but all of this, this can be another indicator of how personalized, how individualized this prayer could be. You know yourself. You know your attention spans. You know the pace. You you learn quickly enough what pacing works for you. Cool. It's your relationship with Jesus, you know. Yes, sir, one more. Uh, we have one question from the chat and then a comment, if we have time for both of those. Okay, well, yes. I'll just read, uh, I'll read the comment first and then maybe we could end with the question. Okay. Um, this is from Mary. Uh, she says, Aloha, this is Mary from Hawaii. <laughs> uh, so we got some distance there. Yeah. She says, I am so grateful for this space. I found myself on the road as the Levite, walking through downtown Honolulu, an area where many houseless folks spend time. The scene of a broken spirit and broken, ill body felt familiar, yet I didn't stop. I could feel the man's anger, his shame, his sadness. Most of all, I could feel his expectations being met. He knew I wouldn't stop. I felt deep shame at my unwillingness to help and at my own fear. Mm -hmm. Yet at the end, Jesus met me and spoke to me, saying, quote, You are still my beloved. My love is not dependent on your choices. Yet I want you to follow me. You will have more chances to follow me. End quote. Wow. Can we just stop there? Amen. Beautiful. <laughs> Uh, you have one question, and then we'll finish. Yes. Uh, one question, which I think will be a practical takeaway. Uh, they just said, uh, you provided prompts throughout the exercise. How would we do this as a solo exercise? 
on on your own. Um, you can create your own exercise. I mean, I just created this myself. So the question is, how would we do this on our own? Experiment with it. I'm sure this is a praying person. Uh, Google Ignatian Imaginative Contemplation. There's a lot of information. There's a really good website. I think it's LoyolaSpirituality.com. Uh, LoyolaSpirituality.com or .org. So, so I would say, because we're out of time, get do some homework. Yes, ma'am. Reading through the text, draw, ah. stop along the way at each one, and then ex uh, write out their emotions. What are you feeling? What are you sensing? So in other words, slow read and allow yourself to be fully emerged. And that's how you could do a solo one. And draw pictures, do colors, get up, scream, whatever. But don't rush through the text. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, we're over time. Thank you so much. Was it, uh, I pulled up Loyola Spirituality Center.org. No. Would that be it? Oh, okay. Can you Google Loyola Spirituality.com? Yeah. I was just going to put it in the chat for the people. Super. Gone. I've got my phone too. I'm pretty sure that's it. They're probably the most comprehensive. Anybody finding it? Ignatian spirituality? Ignatian, I-G-N-A-T-I-A-N. Does that come up? Mm-hmm. I'm sure that's the one. Yeah, IgnatianSpirituality.com. It's very good for people who want to learn more. And it's heavily lay people. It's Jesuits, but there's a lot of lay people involved in this website. It's a non, and it's a nonprofit. Okay, cool. Fabulous. Fabulous. Oh, yeah.